You're listening to the Self-Made is a Myth, Make a Difference Together show with your host, Coach Tim Campsall, where we talk with successful business owners to hear the stories of their journeys in building their successful businesses. And more importantly, we recognize the folks who help them excel because we know that achieving business success is not something we can do on our own. Hello, everyone. This is Coach Tim Campbell, and I'm excited to have a fellow business owner from Indiana with us today. Something unique about my guest is that uh, he was cut from the Cal the Dallas Cowboys as a kicker. He also played uh, college soccer as well as professionally overseas. In his downtime, he enjoys uh, coaching youth sports and being outside with his kids. And he's most proud of maintaining his conviction to build his nonprofit, which he's going to share a little bit about with us today. Uh, at the same time, running that nonprofit, he's able to take Fridays off to prioritize his family. What an awesome uh, balance. It's my pleasure to welcome Brandon to the show today. Hi, Brandon. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for the, the gracious introduction. Um, sports were definitely a huge part of my life, but also a great lesson. And sometimes things don't work out the way you would think they might. Um, which is, which is totally cool too. So great experiences along the way. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, Hey, let's start with having you introduce yourself, uh, and, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you personally. So tell us your name and uh, yeah. where you were born and live about your family and hobbies. So uh, Tim and I have this in common. I grew up in Southeast Michigan. And so sometimes there might be words that I say with a little more nasally accent and, uh, you know, Tim was a little more Northern than, than Michigan, but, um, so grew up in Southeast Michigan, uh, grew up with, uh, my, my parents, I have an older sister and, uh, just grew up, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, low key life in a lot of ways. My dad worked for general motors, my wife or my, my wife, my mom worked, uh, my mom worked in the schools. And so, yeah, just kind of a normal upbringing uh, in, in that sense, um, but really fell in love with sports. My dad was really into sports. That was a huge part of my life. I think where I learned a lot of life lessons over the over the years, um, back in the for former days of being really, really involved and a lot more athletic uh, in those times. But yeah, grew up um, and really had this desire, had a, a, a call into like pastoral vocational ministry um, which honest, honestly created a sandbox for me to discover entrepreneurship and launching new things and entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. and really had a, a great influential leader in my life who, who really helped shape that and, um, fan that flame, if you will, um, and still in touch with that person to this day. And so that was a, uh, but sports were definitely growing up the whole deal. That was everything growing up close to the university of Michigan. We had, you know, football tickets to watch Michigan in the glory days of Tom Brady and Charles Woodson and all those kind of things. So, uh, grew up in that way, but really got on this path, got involved in different community initiatives and stuff through my church. And that really set off kind of this entrepreneurial itch, if you will. Fantastic. So, uh, where do you live now? We uh we moved to Indianapolis area in 2012. We live in Zionsville. We've been in Zionsville now for about five or six years. Yeah. Fantastic. And tell me a little bit about your town. family. So I'm married to my wife, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a nurse practitioner at a family practice. And then we have three kids, Nora, who is eight, Lucy, who's about to turn five, and Liam, who's a who's uh two and a half. So we're 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 in the midst of juggling family and kids and the whole deal. And it's I wouldn't have it any other way. Awesome. So you played soccer uh, growing up and, and in college and a little bit professionally. So how'd you find yourself trying out to be a Dallas Cowboys kicker? So it's a crazy kind of story. There was a guy who had played in the NFL and he had come to um, the town that I was, I was a youth pastor is my first job out of college. And so he was coming into different school assemblies and things like that. And he had heard some things about my soccer career and all that. And he's like, have you ever kicked a football? I'm like, ah, just kind of messing around. So I'd never played a down of football in my life, you know, <laughs> outside of backyard football or whatever. I was, you know, too busy doing soccer and hockey and all the basketball, all those things. And, uh, long story short, he's like, I want you to go kick some footballs and tell me how it goes. So I ended up, um, this was crazy to me kicking a 66 yard field goal, which, you know, is decent. And so ended up, <laughs> 
through this guy getting connected to like a semi-pro football team to get like footage and then worked with a guy named uh, Jim Garrett. Jim Garrett was a scout working, um, worked with a lot of special teamers. His son was Jason Garrett, who was the head football coach for the Dallas Cowboys at the time. And so all these different workouts and different things like that. And it came down to me and this um, kid from the University of Florida with similar type workouts. And they ended up uh, going with him instead of me. But it, it left me with some opportunities, some arena football league tryouts and some opportunities with that. Um, but at that time, I, you know, put about a year into this football thing while working full time, was about to get married. And so it was kind of like, if this doesn't happen, kind of got to give up on this. But it was it was an amazing experience. It led to being able to coach special teams at a pretty large uh, high school and be an influence with the kids there. So it was great. What a fun story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So speaking of uh, fun stories, is there a, a funny story that your family likes to tell about you that you'd be willing to share with us today? I think like a more relevant one for my, uh, my wife and my kids, you know, there's plenty growing up, but, um, more recently, I've kind of, I'm jumpy. So literally our kids will like quietly tiptoe through a room and they just show up and I'm <laughs> always getting just shocked, you know, surprised. It happened even this weekend. My wife came outside. I was working on something, had no idea she was there. So that's kind of a, you know, not, there's plenty of, <laughs> plenty of stories, some appropriate, some probably inappropriate for this podcast, but that's the one recently is I've turned into a jumpy person and I never knew that was something about me. My, kid, my kids think it's hilarious. They think it's a fun game to scare dad. Yeah. It sounds like it would be a little bit fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brandon, tell us uh, how did the business come about and at what point did you have the confidence that you could run your own business? Yeah, that's a, that's a great Great question. And it, it it's one of those stories, you know, you, you hear all these uh, entrepreneurship stories and people just had this like light bulb moment and they start the thing the next day and then they, you know, grind at it by themselves in their garage for, you know, the next two years. And then by year three, they're a multimillionaire. Uh, that's not my story, right? So much of my uh, story is not just about what I chose to do. It was like what was happening in the community around me um, people speaking things into my life, me probably dragging my feet longer than I should have to start something. So uh, I, I think a lot of this started swirling for me in 2015. And, um, but the work did not launch until 2019, if that tells you anything. Mm. And so um, I think that's, there, there's sometimes these over romanticized um, stories of entrepreneurship or, or launching a new work or a business or a nonprofit. Mine was like the slow burn that grew <laughs> conviction. And so in 2015, I had gone through this kind of coaching process to kind of figure out my unique skills, abilities. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I was a little apprehensive towards it. I had just finished a, you know, was finishing my master's program that was focused on organizational leadership. So all these assessments, online tests, which are super helpful. They're great, whether as an individual or for a team. Um, but I was like, man, I don't need another one of those. <laughs> and so I went through this process that a boss of mine had connected me to a, a friend of his. And it was absolutely transformational. It helped me put language to kind of the angst I was maybe feeling in my career, uh, the desires in my heart, how to put language to those. What what do I really value in work? What do I really value um, in terms of using my transferable skills, what do I, um, what kind of culture do I want to be a part of or help create? Mm. And then what are these kind of X factor purpose things in my life? And so this, this kind of coaching process was really, really helpful to me and really helped me to start moving towards this idea of, you know, what does it mean to empower the everyday leader? There's all these world-class mm. resources available to executives mainly. And I actually even benefited from those processes, right? I, 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 but I watched my peers not get access to those kinds of things and thought, man, what would it look like to in like kind of invert that reality? What would it look like as a, the pain point or a problem to solve? And I didn't know that that would be through starting a nonprofit one day and then also starting a, a consulting company as well. I didn't know that that would be the way in which I'd go about it. But I just knew that this, this problem existed that I was bumping into in my world. 
and that I saw in my reality and my context and thought, man, what if that could be different and started to put some ideas to that. I thought I would do it, you know, as I neared retirement, maybe start something <laughs> like this. But then um, part of this framework, you have to have these verifying conversations. You have to go to people who would speak into um, things that you see in the short term and long term. And when you do that with the right trusted group of people, um, there's just something beautiful that happens. And so a lot of those people had said, you know, we really think um, in the next few years, you really, you're onto something, you should start something, whether that's a business nonprofit, but there's some, there's a pain problem. We want to affirm that we want to affirm who you are as a leader. And so over those next uh, couple of years, um, this, this, this groaning and this idea grew with conviction and sometimes slower than I wanted it to, but then the conviction really started to grow as others. Um, we'd studied a, a, a church planting movement in India and watched how they were just starting like nonprofits left and right. Very simple um, in, in varied contexts. And that just gave us a reference point, it gave us a reference point, not to just copy paste, but to, and so um, I felt like there was a thread of community that came around the conviction that I had. And that was really pivotal, especially for a nonprofit to have community around it. Um, and so long story short, in 2019, I quit my day job, um, gave like a 12 weeks notice, a private foundation had heard about some of the ways I was using this kind of coaching framework to help people um, discover purpose, move towards career paths. The, the guy who I had gone through that process with gifted me his life's work and said, just steward this well, whatever that's going to look like. So, but the, the conviction really grew to a place to say, yeah, we want to put this into a nonprofit um, to help people discover purpose, um, whether that's career related or just ways they want to get involved in the community, put it at an affordable price point, scholarship people through and then also help people uh, launch new um, courageous initiatives, grassroots businesses, nonprofits, ministries, you name it, and have like a pathway for them to do that. And so um, quit quit my day job uh, in, in 2019, stepped into this. And then also what we found out is um, this framework was really um, going to help people kind of in their professional context, like in their workplace. So we stood up a, a business we call Switchback. And it's a, a small consulting company where we help people develop personal development plans. They co-create those with their managers. We give some tools to managers on how to have those conversations. And so that really helped us uh, kind of pay for a couple of us, you know, doing that work yeah. that we really believed in and thought was great and created all these backend applications to it while also still building what was what we ended up naming Wayfinders as our nonprofit, which is now, you know, from 2019, that you know, got, well, it started as an entity, but 501c3 status, all that was awarded in 2020. There's a process there. Yeah. And so those, those, that was the big, the big move, right? Like the, the safety net is gone. We had just had our second child. Yeah. She was a month old and it's like, we're going with conviction, had a little bit of support from a private foundation and uh, made the leap. Wow. That is awesome. So tell us a little bit more about the company. What's the name? What do you guys do? How do you help people? Yeah, so Wayfinders um, is a nonprofit. Uh, we're located in Brownsburg, Indiana. So I live in Zionsville, but we have a, a missional co-working hub here in Brownsburg uh, with a podcast studio, uh, co-working space, offices, conference room, you name it. Um, and our mission is to help everyday leaders move into the future and make the greatest impact. So we curate various environments. We put them in three buckets. Um, one bucket is called discover. And that's kind of like, we want to help people discover who you are, your distinct impact for good. So that could be career related. You're in a career transition. We've worked with executive. We've served over 5,000 people through our flagship program called life mapping. You, we have a process for middle school and high school students all the way up to, you know, people in their eighties who've gone through this that are looking to kind of activate purpose, use their skills to serve the community as well as people at the at the peak of their professional career. Um, there's a chief technology officer that we worked with, you know, two years ago, um, who's thriving in the community. We've worked with um, superintendents and principals and school teachers, uh, pastors. We've worked with 
um, you know, people in sales and business development, you name it, varied industries. Uh, we have different workshops for that. And so that's kind of been our flagship, you know, program, if you will. We also host one called an impact identity workshop that will partner with other nonprofits and churches facilitate that there as well as here locally, which is just kind of creating a personal impact statement for your life. Okay. Then uh, the second part is launch. Uh, we have curated paths where we help people launch the impact they want to make. So that might be some grassroots thing they do in their neighborhood, some sort of need that they see. Um, or that might be something like standing up a nonprofit or a, a missional redemptive business or um, some sort of ministry. And so we have um, free workshops that we host called Start Something Workshops, where you literally start something. Uh, <laughs> and we and we encourage people to put a date to that and just start the activity, right? Just start the activity. And sometimes those are ideated in those workshops right there. Other times people have been sitting on an idea kind of like I was mm -hmm. for several years. And they're like, I just don't know how to activate this thing. I don't know what to do. It's not that they don't have get up. It's not that they don't have work ethic. They're just like, I don't even know how this fits with the context of working a nine to five and family and all that. And then we invite them, uh, certain individuals from that into a six month cohort where not only do we pour into their idea, but we pour into that leader with our various frameworks, connect them to relational capital, connect them to uh, sometimes financial capital, um, all those different things to, we call that our impact studio, right? Uh, you heard about like tech studios and all this yeah. stuff. This is our impact studio and we'll have a class that comes through. Um, we'll start in September and we're, uh, we've been taking applications right now for that, that process. And so um, we've helped, um, we can't always measure what will uh, always exist, mm -hmm. but we can measure how many people we lead through our Start Something framework. And so far in 2020, I think we're at 204 individuals who've gone through our Start Something framework and really put flesh to an idea. And we know that over the last three and a half years or so that we've helped like 25 different organizations get started. Um, and so we, we love that a lot of them are very grassroots missional might be a side hustle side project. And then some of them, it's their full-time work now. Um, and then the third piece is, uh, you know, so there's discover launch and the third piece is partner to make an impact with us. Um, and, and not just to us, right. But with us come and serve, be a part of the impact studio as a community leader, an entrepreneur, come speak into others who are at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it might mean making a decision to use our co-working space. And there's those kind of collisions that happen when you get like-minded people in the room. We have a community night we called groundwork. We just had one last week, a guy who used to be a DJ. J and hip hop artists and still does some of that. And is also a pastor led and talked about BPMs and how, you know, we each kind of have a rhythm of a season that we're in. It was amazing. And all these, I mean, we had, uh, you know, high net worth individuals in the room to people who are in college to everything in between multiple ethnicities represented. It was a beautiful space to be in, you know, as we seek to become everyday leaders in our own context. And then, um, and then obviously, you know, people who as a nonprofit, yes, we have some program revenue through, through some of our offerings, but people can partner in our, our work financially as well as a nonprofit so that we can continue to offer these kinds of programs, uh, for free or at a very reduced, you know, from market rate cost, uh, to individuals. And then behind all of that, you know, I was a pastor for 15 years. So we have some different spiritual formation frameworks that are accessible. So we, we go into environments where there's no spiritual connotation. There's nothing like overt direct. I mean, we like to go into, we're in schools, we're in nonprofits, all kinds of different environments, but then we have certain environments where, uh, people who want resourcing, um, for spiritual formation, um, that they can access that as well. So that's a big part of all of our work as well. That's awesome. What a great, a great story and a great journey you've been on. <clears throat> so, Thanks, Tim. Brandon, share a story where someone pushed you or inspired you that you could do it, even though maybe you didn't think that you could and the impact that person had on you. Yeah, I think going even back to um, the verification conversations from that life mapping you mm -hmm. process, it really, you know, sometimes you have people in your life who will give you that unsolicited advice, you know, <laughs> that sometimes you, 
you want and sometimes you just need. Um, but going after a couple of intentional, there was, uh, there's three men, Jeff, Ken, and John, who, um, older, wiser, had all of them had um, started something at one point. Okay. And so they probably have a little bit of that disposition in them, you know, to say, go do this. Yeah. But they also have, they're also very discerning people. And so they're, they're not going to just tell you to go take this crazy risk and all that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so when I went to them and was just talking about my career and my desires and just kind of this conviction and angst, they were all kind of like, yeah, we could to we totally see you starting something like you're behind the eight ball here, buddy. Like we've all seen this for years. <laughs> and, um, that was just a good, you know, that other people's words should never be the sole reason you go and do something. Sure. But when you're kind of wrestling around and thinking about it, um, you know, and I, I do have a, on my own can have kind of like a high risk, you know, tolerance, if you will. But when you have a family and you have kids yeah. and you're like, man, I, you know, it's not like things were going poorly in my life or my career. Yeah. So it really just put more, you know, encouragement, like it put courage in me, mm -hmm. you know, hearing from those guys and having them speak into it and affirming that. And so that, um, we like to call them around here. I see in you conversations. Like I see this in you. I uh. see this thing. in you. <laughs> and when you see it, you got to say it. Right. And so I, that now I didn't go and just start something that even within a year of those, but I started moving towards it. Yeah. I started moving towards the activity. I started yeah. moving towards and behaving that way. And so when it was time, then I went back to those same group, the same group of people and said, Hey, here's now this actual opportunity <laughs> to do this with still some risk, but not as much risk of just, you yeah. know, choosing to do it on a random Tuesday. And that was really formative for me and encouraging. And for basically my ask of them was like, will you kind of walk with me mm. as I do this? Yeah. And their answer was, well, of course. That's fantastic, Brandon. Well, Hey, let's, let's shift gears here a little bit. Tell me, What's been your biggest learning as a business owner? Ooh, you know, one of our values is collaboration. And, you know, I, I know that's a, can be a buzzword, a popular word these days, but to really make decisions in a collaborative manner to empower each other as a team. Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but our, I had to be away for six weeks last summer. And a lot that was related to a significant health issue with one of my kids. And so it was just like, no warning. No, this was not in the plans and um, really saying, okay, how, how well are our values actually going to stand up mm. of empowering, of establishing culture? Cause I'm just going to be gone and I don't have, there's no time for like handoffs. There's no time for information mm. exchange. It was it was a pretty intense time for us as a family. And so really coming back and seeing the sacrificial nature of our team, people mm. stepping in, our board, volunteers, our community, um, you know, it, it really, it really pushed me more and more to say, Hey, we talk about this value, but our team really lives this out. Yeah. And I need to continue to grow as a leader to give things away. And so even on the other side, my daughter's health is doing fantastic at this point. But, you know, coming back to it was, was a very disorienting time to catch up. Yeah. Where are we at? What do we need to be doing? But to really trust um, our values mm. to embody those. And it challenges me to give away more, more leadership uh, or make sure that I don't take on certain leadership in the first place to give yeah. away. Like this is just available. <laughs> um, and, and the value of communication, um, both, you know, verbal and written, all of that helps you kind of get through those times. And so I, I think that's been one of the biggest learnings. It's like a, a thing that you maybe see I've seen as a strength or had complimented as a strength, 
over the years, but to say, man, that is just an area that I feel like I'm still just in infancy mm. and maybe toddler years of growing in that and to not think through the lens of, well, what does Brandon want to do today? <laughs> but think through the lens of what do we need? What do we need in, in the context of our work as a community in the context of our team, what's needed today. Yeah. And um, I would rather have it planned scheduled. <laughs> I'd rather have it all buttoned up. Um, but that's been a, a beautiful part of, of the journey for me and very humbling to know that this work um, will continue without my presence yeah. and that 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 is significant and i want to continue to push towards that because ultimately we want to multiply our work yeah. uh, in and through others that's the nature of what we do at wayfinders and so um yeah it was a it was a crash course and <laughs> do you really believe this is the way to go for me over the last year <laughs> i love it there's a a lot of folks who I hear business owners say uh, all the time, like no one can do the job as well as me. Right? And there is that fear of letting go and, and trusting that somebody can, can carry the ball. Now it obviously it doesn't happen. You're in your case, it sort of happened overnight, but you'd, you'd, yeah. you'd laid the seed, you know, you'd laid the groundwork mm -hmm. and you'd prepared people to be able to do it. So one of the things I, I share with business owners as well you know, you have whatever, five years or 10 years or 15 years of experience and expertise in your head. Of course, somebody's not going to be able to do it as good as you in two weeks. But if we, you know, if we spread out the training process and document, right, and write out the processes and the procedures over time, people can learn to do it as good as you. And now you've, mm -hmm. to your point, right, you've freed yourself up to be able to focus on the next thing and the next thing and know that the team's able to, to carry the ball and, and, you know, run that part of the organization or that process or that procedure and no longer has mm. as the owner as the bottleneck yeah absolutely absolutely and so, yeah that those lessons it's like oh when tim says that and that makes a lot of sense when you're in it <laughs> right you're yeah. like ah yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's it's funny tim. you you say you mentioned that i Oftentimes I'll coach my clients on a similar topic all week. And then my coach will point it out for me and I'd be like, oh my goodness, right? It's so yeah. much easier to yeah. see it in someone else than it is to see it in ourselves. Totally. <laughs> I agree. Hey, Brandon, we know that business success doesn't happen in isolation. So tell us about one of your biggest challenges as a business owner and maybe someone who came alongside you and helped you to get through that challenge. Yeah, I think um, one of the challenges early on was there was someone who had gone through this framework um, that it was really beneficial to them. And uh, the owner of the company that they ended up working for said, hey, tell me about this process. You seem very articulate on what you want, kind of growth you're interested in in, in, in our company. And so they shared, they shared that. And that was really, uh, I had had like kind of a coaching LLC stood up uh, previously. And so what we, what we did is we, we ended up forming a consulting company because that didn't really fit within the scope of the mission mm -hmm. of Wayfinders as a nonprofit. And we wanted to keep those things very separate. And so that was a challenge on just like, honestly, I didn't want to do that. I'm like, oh, we already made the leap to do this nonprofit. Like, I don't want to do a business too. <laughs> and um didn't have maybe the confidence mm. to be in the business world. You know, I'd been in kind of nonprofit and ministry world, if you will. And so it was like, oh, who would want to, who would want to do this with me? Sure. Or who would want to do this with the company that we build kind of a thing. And so that challenge then became, you know, people saying, hey, 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 no, 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 no. You, you do have these things. And this could be a great way to steward things well as you were building this nonprofit to let things kind of grow there, but then to kind of, you know, help financially and all these kinds of things and relieve some of that burden mm. from the nonprofit. But what if we started this consulting company? Yeah. And so that was a big challenge to cross that, not only the entrepreneurial, let's start a nonprofit, but even that imposter syndrome thing that can really, that can be pretty gnarly yeah. to say, Hey, I can start a com a company too. And, and we can create kind of this, you know, use this core process, but then on the back end, 
create all these different applications. You know, me and and, and the co-founder Matt Kurtz, we you know, we've, we've both led staff teams in our career and all this kind of stuff. He's a former CFO and business, a local business owner at Bogan Eye Care here in Brownsburg. So get your uh, optometry needs met there. <laughs> Stephanie's my eye doctor. Um, but, um, you know, that, that was a, a gnarly second entrepreneurial, you know, water slide to ride down as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, landing, landing a client, based off of them being like, Hey, we, you did this for this person. Can you help us contextualize this for our team and do it for our whole team? And we've been, you know, working with them since 2019 to this day. Awesome. And so, um, we love the, the guys over in and gals over at seamless roofing and, um, worked with them. They've been amazing, uh, anchor client on the business side. And I'm out of the day to day on that stuff now, right? I'm full time, just focused on Wayfinders. Um, we got a, a couple of guys who who run that over at Switchback now. But um, what's great is um, not only did they uh, become clients of the business side, but they got involved in volunteering with Wayfinders as well as you know many of them on their team have, you know, donated financially to the work of Wayfinders, our participants in the work have helped us create bridges of opportunities for kids that we serve in the city to have some job shadowing experience, things like that. So that's been really, really cool to see how do these two worlds make sense? And then actually seeing them all to come together has been really, really powerful. That is awesome. So shifting gears to the future, uh, as you think about the next one to three years, Brandon, what's the, what's your number one priority or the challenge that you need to uh, uh, to overcome in order to achieve your goals? It's a great question. I, you know, I think a lot of times people know us based on one of those three prongs that discover launch partner that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So they maybe have interacted with us in one of those spaces. Um, but they maybe haven't interacted with us in all of those spaces. And we're seeing more and more people who have and just um, how transformational that is for them, not only for them to discover and activate something or launch something, but for them to to, um, have a community of like-minded folks to be around or a space to be in where they can be doing those things. And so I think for us, uh, one of the areas would just be, you know, cleaning up our messaging of, and, and, and we're actually just talked about it this morning as a team, a visual that kind of describes all of our work and what okay. that kind of looks like in a, in a yeah. visual sense. And, you know, one of those kind of growth curve things, you know, anytime they feel like you update your, and we have a beautiful website, really grateful for that. Um, but anytime you feel like you update your website, you, you feel like something's outdated or something needs to be changed or tweaked or whatever. So that's, that's definitely one of those for people to understand the collective nature of everything we're doing and not just the segmented nature of that. And, um, and I think that'll really feed itself. Right. And people can enter. There's not like a point a to a point C or a point E for us. People can enter in at the launch phase, but then maybe they need to get some of this discovery stuff. Maybe, maybe they enter in at partner, but they need to get some of this launch thing going whatever that might be. So that for us would be just kind of that, that marketing type visual that people can understand very succinctly when they come to our website. Um, when, when we, we meet with them, um, because if people get into our environments, they see it pretty quickly. What we're, what we're all about. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Awesome. Last question, Jim Rohn, awesome business guru. One of his famous quotes is we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So as you Think about that quote. What advice would you have for business owners who are trying to do it on their own? Yeah, I think that's the um, the isolation and just betting on myself idea uh, hasn't worked for me ever in my life. <laughs> um, you know, opportunities, whether in athletics, whether in ministry positions, whether in launching this work as a business owner in a in a nonprofit kind of a good preneur, if you will. Um, it's never happened in isolation. It's never happened on my own abilities. It's never happened on the things that I could strong arm. And so, I, I mean, I really do believe, you know, having people speak into you as you go, as well as speaking into your idea and making sure that you don't, you're not just a, you know, around here, Matt always says, let's not be a solution looking for a problem. Like, let's actually <laughs> see a problem yeah. and then create a solution. I love it. 
<laughs> and so um, my my advice would just simply be, you know, how do you not just see your own intellectual capital? How do you not just see your own relational capital? Yeah. How do you not only see your your own financial capital, right? Those kinds of things. And to know that um, Indianapolis, especially for those listening in Indianapolis, is a very, um, everyone's kind of like one phone call away sort of thing environment, yeah. right? And very <laughs> community. Community oriented. I think people are really cheering for people in small business and in grassroots nonprofits and things like that. I think people get that here. And so I think um, seeing, I, I was just talking to a guy last week. He's going to come into one of our, our impact studio program. He's got a great idea for a really missionally minded business. So it's going to be a great business with a really cool give back opportunity through it. And he's just like, I just don't have enough time. I'm working my other job. He's newly married. And we just started like, man, what are these other capital? You're only looking at the capitals you possess yeah. that you have or that you right. think that you have. And man, I have, I've been there before. Right. And so <laughs> I would just say, Hey, who are those people you can lean into lean on that'll go there that people that will go to bat for you, people who will make an introduction for you people who will let you sit in on a meeting, people who will help you figure out your, you know, go to market plan, people who will help you figure out market, you know, various market research. And is this an actual problem or a pain point? Or maybe you get, they'll give you an opportunity to have a trial on something or be your first client. And so I think though that relational capital, intellectual capital, financial capital, making sure that we see a broader picture of abundance outside of just what I possess or what I think I possess is what I would encourage them with. What uh, what an awesome uh, advice for everyone listening. If you you're on the line here, listen to this, jot that down. It, it, you you definitely uh, want to take advantage of the people that you don't even know that are there to to offer you a hand. So, yeah. um, Brandon, it sounds like you've been blessed with some incredible people in your journey. If they were all here on the show today, what would you want to say to them? I love them. You know, like I just love them, and I'm great grateful for them in in every way. And so um, I think I would just tell them, man, thank you for seeing something in me. Thank you for the invitation uh, to grow through this entrepreneurship journey, right? Like if it all burned away, if it all <laughs> burned down, now I hope that does not happen, but like if it were, <laughs> if it were to, I knew that I gave it a fair shake and a fair shot and that people's lives uh, were impacted in and through, not just what Brandon says or does, but through what has been built and created and shared in. And so um, I would just say, thank you. I love them. It's been the journey of a, a lifetime. It's been hard. It's been beautiful, but they, those people have not only been there from the beginning, but they've stayed and remained uh, active in my life. And so, yeah, like the opportunities that have been created through uh, collaboration and through conversations and introductions are beyond what I could have ever imagined in of myself doing. And that's where I think, you know, this whole, maybe, maybe I'm definitely the least self-made person. Um, it's like community, <laughs> community made. And and I kind of was on, I got to tail around for the ride and was the, per <laughs> and was just the person who was willing to say, yes, let's start this thing and then see what happens. And sometimes that's all it takes is someone to say, yep, we see a common pain point. Let's bring this together yeah. and let's steward this idea. Let's steward this solution well. And I would just, yeah, tell them thank you for allowing me to steward these things alongside them. Fantastic. Brandon, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everything you're doing to help leaders get better as well, Tim. Thanks for listening to the Self-Made is a Myth show. Please help spread this movement by liking and subscribing to our show and following us on Facebook and LinkedIn. To join our movement, go to BeMadTogether.com. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. Please pay it forward and be sure to tune in next time to the Self-Made is a Myth podcast.